Hello and welcome to all our One Young World 2022 delegates. In this session, we will be focusing on plastic pollution, a threat to the ocean's health. My name is Danielle Crompton. I'm a One Young World ambassador. And with my work hat on, I'm an ethics and sustainability manager at the John Lewis Partnership. I will be moderating this session. I'm thrilled to be joined by Managing Director and Founder of Love the Oceans, Francesca Trotman, Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Surfers Against Sewage, Hugo Tagholm, and Co-Founder of A Plastic Planet, Sean Sutherland. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've got a really exciting session planned. So I'm, I'm going to start with, with this question, and, and we put some nice um, statistics in here as well to add a bit of context. So... A question, the question says, the International Union for Conservation of Nature have estimated that at least 14 million tonnes of plastic are introduced into the oceans every year. What impact does this volume have on marine ecosystems and marine life? And I, I was thinking maybe, Hugo, how would you feel about answering that one first? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely fine. Um, look, a uh, 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 an enormous quantity of plastic pollution goes into the ocean um, every year. Um, it's one global ocean, and this this plastic uh, moves around um, around our ocean and and uh, goes to all sorts of different parts and, and breaks up in its journey, um, and, and causes multiple damages to, to marine life. Um, uh, millions of seabirds and animals die every year um, through entanglement, ingestion, um, uh, from coming into contact with, with plastic pollution, um, the waste of our convenient lifestyles, um, the waste from the expectation society has on, on consumption these days. Um, and it's something that the world still hasn't really got a true grasp on. Uh, more and more people since 2017, particularly since the Blue Planet, have, have come forward to take action on this. And there have been some good, small sort of victories, one to protect uh, marine life, marine ecosystems. But the sad truth is um, too much plastic is still being produced, uh, which contributes to that 14 million tonnes every year. And we all see it. Our volunteers around the country here in the UK and around the world see it on every tideline, on every riverbank, on every city street. Um, plastic pollution that we're all too familiar with um, from our high streets um, through to fishing gear, um, uh, just, just washing up. And the science is only just emerging as to the impacts it could have in the long term on, on the health of, of, of animals um, in the marine ecosystem and on our health. So many animals ingest plastic, like plastic is spread throughout the water column um, at all different depths. Um, and so you've not only got like just the plastic that you're like, that we're seeing on camera and in documentaries, it's actually spread like so widely. Um, and part of that is obviously animals eating plastic, animals getting entangled and I think people forget that like whales and turtles and dolphins they're air breathers right so if they're entangled in a discarded fishing net they can't breathe and they drown um there's been so many so many incidents of whales consuming plastic um especially sperm whales that feed on um squid deep sea squid and they use echolocation, so they throw out a click and they get like a 3D image back and they're, they actually hunt in pitch black. And in terms of that kind of click, a plastic bag looks very similar to a squid. And so they're consuming a lot of plastic that way. And unfortunately, that plastic is filling their stomachs. Um, so they are full, but they're not getting nutrients and they're starving to death with full stomachs. So another statistic that we've seen is um, a 2021 study that was undertaken by the Plastic Waste Makers Index, which found that just 20 firms are responsible for 55% of global plastic waste. So on that point of accountability, I guess the question is, what do you think can be done to hold major plastic polluters to account? Um, maybe, Sean, that's something that you would like to, to reflect on. I'd love to, Danielle. Thank you for the opportunity. And another great, great step that really relates to this one is much as there's 20 consumer goods firms responsible for that 55% of the global, the branded trash that we see. It's also another step that 20 
companies alone are the polymer manufacturers responsible for well over half the plastic pollution that we see. So you can drill these things back to very small numbers. And there was a, another great study um, by Planet Tracker that actually looked at, and the Mindaroo Foundation had looked at, okay, who are the people making the plastic? Not even just using the plastic, but making the plastic, the polymer manufacturers. And then let's go one layer back and think, and who owns them? Who are the shareholders? Who sits on the board? There's very little transparency about that. And then the sad but true thing is then you look at who owns them and it comes all the way full circle to, it's us. We own them because the pension schemes own them, the governments own them. So it's that sad truth that actually the thing that is destroying the future of our children's uh, generation is something that we are funding ourselves without even knowing. There, there's, a, there's been a, 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 a really strong sort of narrative since, um, since the Blue Planet was screened, but even predating that of individual responsibility. Um, and a lot of big companies have tried to um, foist um, the accountability onto, uh, onto their consumers, onto the public, uh, onto us as individuals. And this is an age old trick of big business. Um, it's not our fault, it's your fault because you want what we're making. Um, and if you didn't want it, um, there wouldn't be a problem. Um, and they really, um, they really have tried this since the, the very dawn of plastics, uh, when a lot of the big drinks manufacturers moved their, their drinks from glass bottles into plastic bottles um, uh, as this sort of magic material, but also launched it with the claim that, that people, um, people sort of start pollution and pollution can end with with individuals responsibility to the famous crying Indian campaign, I believe in the States, um, which I don't think would get past anybody's standards or ethics um, these days. Um, uh, for us, I think, you know, we, we need, uh, we need these, we believe we need these global treaties and, and really strong legislation that forces companies to act and forces the reduction in the use of, of plastics. And, and we can start and triage that. We can start by, by looking at the sort of pointless plastics and the easily replaceable plastics because we need a full systems change. I wonder whether, um, Francesca, you have anything to build on that because you've, you've got a lot of first-hand experience about the impacts of um, climate change and how marine pollutants have affected the oceans and, and whether or not you've seen how basically how things have changed throughout the work that you've been doing. I work like I work in a very specific area in Mozambique and we like you go on beach cleans and you see this trash on the shores and I think we forget that like even as recreational even if you're a scuba diver a fully qualified scuba diver you're accessing 40 meters upwards of ocean and the average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. So we're literally accessing 1% of the ocean um, and we're still seeing a horrific amount of plastic. I think people just don't kind of understand how widespread it is. Like where we, where we are, we're based on the edge of the Indian Ocean garbage patch. It's the third biggest garbage patch in the world. So not even the biggest and it's still 5 million kilometers squared and it's plastic everywhere. And we, we take, um volunteers and people to our base and stuff and and um we had a plastic project a while ago with a school that came out and um we upcycle the plastic on the beach into what we call eco bricks and then they're used in um local construction projects and um the school kids were like but but there's not gonna be enough plastic like we're, get, we're gonna do a beach clean and then and then that will be all the plastic and i was like come back at the next high tide and there will still be plastic to get after that. Um, and I think it does like constantly astound people that um, it's just kind of this never ending, um, like a refill of plastic um, in, our, in our oceans. And, and I think people forget that like average life of plastic is 400 years. So like all the nappies of everyone on this call <laughs> are still somewhere in the world today, which is, fairly horrifying um, and if you think about the number of humans on this planet and how widespread that is that's and that's just nappies from my babies like that's crazy yeah that, those are big numbers aren't they um and I, your mention of eco bricks actually has got me thinking about about kind of we know that that this plastic can't remain in the oceans but a lot of it lot of it can't be recycled how, like what can we do with these materials that are being collected? You know, can they be repurposed? Um, what, are, what are some of the options here? I don't know whether um, maybe Hugo and Sean, you've got any reflections on that. 
look, there have been all sorts of um, projects since, um, you know, since the Blue Planet and before um, taking materials out of the sea and, and creating other products from them, um, often with a higher value. Um, so there's a sort of premium on ocean plastic from trainers to sunglasses, from, um, you know, from greetings cards through to whatever else. Um, and I think this is this is a bit confusing for the public. Um, it almost it almost perpetuates the problem um, and and says the ocean trash actually isn't a problem because we can take it out of the ocean and make a high value product from it. And so I think we've got to be really careful about the message we send out because ultimately, as we've as we've talked about in the session so far, we need to reduce the amount of plastic being created. It's not about what we can take out of the ocean. And to Francesca's point, um, much of the the the, the pollution we see um, is, is just in that very thin band around our shoreline or all of the pollution we see or in the top sort of 40 meters of the water column. Most of it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Most of it is out of sight. Most of it becomes microplastics that can enter the food chain in a much more insidious way and harm uh, marine life and enter the food chain, which ends up with us and bioaccumulate various toxins along that route. So creating products out of ocean plastic and sending that out as a positive news story in a way has has helped the public understand that there is a problem of, of ocean ocean plastic pollution uh, and pollution more in the more widespread environment but i think we're at a time now where we have to be very very careful that where we are doing that where companies do that that there's a, a really traceable program that is scalable and that really has a big impact and isn't isn't a, a marketing campaign or a, a tool for a company to get um, get more customers. It is actually something that, that has a tangible, meaningful impact for the ocean. Everything that Hugo has said, times two, um, but it's the, what I find phenomenal is the emotional tug that we have. We say, oh, ocean plastic, that's gotta be a good thing for me. And there is, there's a few weasel words in the, in the world of plastic for me that I would just love to see banned. One of them is recyclable. What does that mean? Who's going to recycle it? You know, at least recycled, although we do know it's downcycled for plastic, but at least a process has happened to it. But just pumping something out, and I'm guilt free now because I made it out of a so allegedly recyclable material when there is zero infrastructure globally, pretty much, to deal with it. That word shouldn't be allowed. And then the other one for me is ocean plastic because it's so emotional. It's such a little tug on your heartstrings. We're so connected to the ocean. We feel so bad about what we've done. Why are we honoring something that shouldn't exist in any way? And as Hugo has just said, it's been massively misused as a marketing tool. The ocean plastic bottle, the ocean plastic trainer. And what I see you know, now, the new thing is the diverted ocean plastic. Like it didn't even get to the ocean. So we're even better because we preempted it being ocean plastic. It's like, where, what's gonna happen next? It's a crazy world. And we have to cut straight through it. Thank you. I'm really loving hearing all of these um, perspectives. We don't have a lot of time left, but I do have a couple of last questions for you, um, if that's okay. One of the things I think that I would like to kind of think about is, is whether or not us focusing on this plastic pollution could be a distraction from the larger climate crisis. And how do the two fit together in a nice, um, you know, nicely rather than, yeah. <laughs> Sean is waving pick at me. me. Pick me. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you're bringing that up because there has been this extraordinary sleight of hand by the fossil fuel industry, big plastic, decoupling the plastic crisis from the climate crisis, the carbon crisis, when of course plastic is solid climate crisis, it's solid carbon. And uh, just being up in Glasgow in November at, at COP, extraordinary to me that plastic wasn't on the agenda in any way. So what we're hoping to enlighten you, the three of us today, and please store up some questions because we want to be challenged. We want to enlighten you to the fact that these two things should never be decoupled, that they are so completely connected. And in fact, plastic is solid carbon crisis. The plastics industry as a country is the fifth biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. How can it be? We all know plastic is plan B for the fossil fuel industry. 
as the reduction in demand for fossil fuels for energy with the increase in renewable happens, they are switching very quickly now, which is why we're forecast to treble plastic production within the next few years. So they are so intrinsically connected. And the, the other thing for me that connects them even more, which is a more kind of ethical, uh, the reason I'm so obsessed by plastic as an entrepreneur is it's the gateway to everything. If we fix plastic, we will directly and indirectly fix so much else. And it is the one material that has very directly created the climate crisis that enabled us to ramp up to these giddy levels of hyperconsumption that broke the model of repair, refill, reuse to this new model that we think is normal now, where you buy something, you use it and you throw it away. And that has only been enabled by this extraordinarily cheap, miraculous material that we should have put on a pillar, priced like gold and respected, but instead we literally treat like rubbish. Climate change and, uh, and, and plastic pollution are, are, are one, one and the same. They're two sides of the, 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 the same, same coin. Um, you know, cheap, cheap, cheap oil, um, cheap plastics has, has fueled this, this ever increasing spiral of consumerism and expectation in society, which is, is, is fundamentally the destroyer of, of the, the biosphere that we live in um, and the planet that we live on. Um, they're both uh, suffocating the health of, um, of all ecosystems. And that's, that's not a dramatization. That's a, the fact all of the metrics of how healthy the planet is are going in the wrong direction. A apart from, you know, there are, there are, there are pockets of hope which we need to learn from and build from the rewilding agenda but we can't rewild successfully that the, the you know all of the buzzwords of the moment blue carbon habitats um, of course reforestation will never succeed unless we limit the emissions from our society the plastics emissions the carbon emissions the toxic chemical emissions the pharmaceutical emissions all of these things which just together and collectively to francesca's point just add up to too many impacts for any wildlife to remain on this 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 planet and we we need a, a diverse and thriving planet to live on we depend on diversity there are no leaders in the wild world there's just diversity specialists operating in in their own way to help us all function together and we're rapidly um, exterminating all of the specialists on this planet for monocultures of of cattle of sheep of crops of plastics of carbon and actually the the, the planet just can't be resilient that way so so you know carbon emissions are plastic emissions and plastic emissions are carbon emissions that's fantastic thank you so much i i picked up on one of the words you said then was about hope and i think that it would be a really nice way to end this session if we can um think about hope think about some of the positives and in particular i'd like to just come to all three of you actually and ask we've got you we've got a group of young leaders um for young leaders who are concerned about climate change, what are the actions that, that they can take, um, particularly in relation to either plastic pollution or, or climate change? Um, your, your top tips, I would say. <laughs> I love hope, but I love action more. So I would say um, add your voice to campaigns um, in terms of like large actions. Obviously, we can make small differences ourselves, but as we've already covered in this uh, consumer blame is one of the massive problems with the entire issue of plastics um so adding your voice to campaigns um that are asking governments to pass better laws and make big corporations more responsible is really useful and supporting organizations that do that <clears throat> like staffers against sewage um and other campaigning organizations is a really good way to do it um educate yourself like learn as much as you can about these issues because that's going to tell you how you can take action more and what you can do um and then i think the final thing would be listen to the scientists um scientists often get ignored uh, and being able to listen to the science amplifies those messages um are, is so important in a world where false news and misinformation is so widespread with social media um and what's the saying like every disaster movie starts with a scientist being ignored so <laughs> listen to the science and take action based on that would be my advice thank you i'm feeling really energized now so this is great so i have huge hope I am, I'm a natural born optimist and I feel incredibly fortunate that we are, particularly me, you know, we are the generation that, that made this mess. 
maybe we can be the generation that becomes part of the solution as well. And for me, the climate crisis and the plastic crisis are a little tap on the shoulder from nature saying, you've gone wrong, you've gone down the wrong cul-de-sac here. This is a design issue. This is a, this is a production problem. So we need to get to the root of the problem and fix it there. So anybody who has listened to this, who's in the creative space, you have tremendous power to design differently at the very beginning, because that's where we need to turn off the tap of plastic. And much as, of course, there's lots of things that we can all do and take personal responsibility. My belief is people's real power is what they do at work. So if you are in a place of work where you can have any impact, punching above your weight to change your organization for the better in, the, in this great plastic fight, I've never seen anything within business bring teams together like plastic does. There are no plastic deniers out there. It's a massive unifier because we all carry the plastic guilt. So when we step forward together in unison on plastic solutions, then I, I think it's amazing what you can achieve. And there are incredible advancements in new materials, in system change, in all the things that we know we need to get to. So I'm hugely optimistic for everybody. I'm always hopeful. We're, a, we're a, an organization that is founded on, on community action um, and people responding to the issues they see on the ground. And I truly believe facing, you know, facing this most important of environmental decades, um, uh, the change will come from communities. We're already seeing the pressure that that is having on, on governments at conferences like the G7 or COP26 or um, the current One Ocean Conference out in France. Um, you know, these are you know these are important times for people to make their voices heard, to come together, to demand change. And I truly believe we're going to see uh, much more radical change than we um, we can sort of believe today by the end of this decade. Oh, thank you so much. How inspiring. That was a really informative and also really in inspiring discussion. So thank you so much, Hugo, Sean and Francesca. Um, on behalf of One Young World, we, we are so happy to have you as part of our community. So thank you very much.